Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. This is the second online webinar of the International Network for Boundary Organizations on Adaptation. Today we'll be talking about enhancing policy engagement to accelerate climate change adaptation. And this webinar is brought to you by the Stockholm Environment Institute in close collaboration with the International Network for Boundary Organizations on Adaptation, which is led by Uranos in Montreal. Maybe we can see the next slide to give you a little bit of background on the International Network of Boundary Organizations on Adaptation. It's a new network. It was set up at um, Adaptation Futures 2023, which took place in Montreal, uh, the initiative of Uranus, and um, it conducts a number of activities, including an ongoing series of webinars, um, aimed mainly at better positioning boundary organizations to inform and shape not only the work of the network, but in, indeed also adaptation policy and practice. Now, this particular webinar is about policy engagement to accelerate climate change adaptation. Um, why do we talk about that? Why do we need to accelerate adaptation? And if we go back to the IPCC sixth assessment report, um, it, it was quite... Um, disappointing um, what it had to say about adaptation. Adaptation is not happening fast enough. There is a gap between what is needed and what is being done. Uh, it is incremental and fragmented. And by and large, we are creating more risk than we are actively reducing by adaptation. In addition, adaptation is becoming more difficult because the climate risks that we're facing are becoming more complex. Now, boundary organizations sit on a lot of knowledge and experience that could help to move adaptation forward. In other ways, in other words, to, to accelerate it locally, nationally, regionally, and globally. And we're going to hear from a number of esteemed speakers who will be speaking from their experience within uh, boundary organizations on, on adaptation. Um, we have, after the keynote, we will hear from Katie Harris from the Stockholm Environment Institute. We will hear from Rajay Shafil from 4C Maroc. We'll hear from Philomena Nelson from SPREP, the South Pacific Regional Environment Program. We'll hear from Maria del Pilar Bueno from Condichet in Argentina and from Lucy Nyuguna, the Alliance of Biodiversity International, SEAT. But we're also very pleased to have Ovas Samet here, who is former UNFCCC Deputy Executive Secretary during, dare I say, turbulent times, so in, in at least an incredibly important time, um, when the UNFCC was really taking adaptation seriously. Um, Ovas has been leading and co-leading until his recent retirement, the secretary. Before that, he was uh, in various other international organizations. Um, but but now in his, in his new role, so to speak, he is particularly interested in engaging with and supporting activities and organizations that promise to innovate and accelerate sustainable development and growth without damaging the environment. And adaptation to climate change is very much part of that. He contributes to and continues to contribute to public policy discourse and development, empowers youth through education at all levels and advisors, mentors and coaches, individuals and organizations in multilateralism, diplomacy, and geopolitics. Oh, Vaz, we're very pleased to hear from you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure for me to be with you all, and uh, 
at the outset would like to thank uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute and the network uh, of the Boundary Organizations and its host organization in Canada. So great pleasure for me to be with all of you. I uh, just want to make sure just if some someone can quickly tell me that you can hear me well and uh, the line is clear. We Great. Can hear you. Yeah, very well. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Richard. Thank you very much for this very kind and generous introduction. And uh, yes, I stepped down from UNFCCC last year after six years of five COPs uh, during, as you rightly said, turbulent times. But then when we talk about climate change and COPs, uh, there's always turbulent times happening in one way or the other, including right now as we speak. So, but that was particularly uh, different or difficult uh, with the, uh, as soon as I uh, stepped into UNFCCC, uh, US withdrew from the Paris Agreement. And soon after we uh, dived into the COVID, COVID situation, and that disrupted uh, a lot of things at that time. So it was, yes, uh, quite challenging, uh, but also a, a an enormous learning experience uh, uh, and engaging with all kinds of different stakeholders. But coming to the topic of the webinar today, it's it's extremely meaningful. And once again, thank you for all those who have worked behind the scenes in conceptualizing and coming together with the, uh, with the topic of, of the webinar today. Adaptation as I see it uh, in the climate change negotiations or UNFCCC process is extremely important, critical, complex, all of that together. Uh, one uh, important point that I feel is missing in dealing with an adaptation when you compare it to other uh, broad uh, areas of negotiation is absence of a comprehensive integrated work plan, similar to what you find in mitigation work plan. Adaptation, and I think there are very good reasons for it. And history, and uh, the way adaptation uh, has evolved over the years, uh, with its different streams, work streams, and different areas of focus, and and it's so diverse, it's difficult to put all that together in a comprehensive, integrated work program, as uh, was the case with mitigation. But that is to say. That is not to say that it cannot be done. I, I think it should. We should one. We should try that. Uh, and why I say that is just to quickly take stock of the landscape of the adaptation before I get into the more specific of the role of the boundary organization. The uh, as as you, I'm, I'm sure many of the participants will recognize, know this. And uh, sorry if I'm repeating or uh, speaking to the converted. The adaptation negotiating tracks or the landscape, so to speak, is, is quite varied, quite broad. And some of the main areas that come to mind and that I would like to highlight is the obviously the national adaptation plans, because it's all to do with what the parties and the countries are able to put together within their national legislations, national planning. And that is done through the na national adaptation plans, keeping in mind the Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, the Sendai Framework, the SDGs, all uh, towards reducing vulnerability and en enhancing resilience of the population, especially those who are at the front line of uh, experiencing or impacted by, the, uh, by, by climate change. And then there are various bodies and committees, uh, again, uh, Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage, uh, Adaptation Committee, Paris, Paris Committee on Capacity Building, CTCN, the Climate Technology Center and Network, uh, and the list goes on. And then there are uh, various, uh, I would say, uh, constituencies that surround the topic, the subject matter of adaptation. The Ringo is definitely one of those, and there are LCIPP, Local Communities, Indigenous People's Platform, the most important ones, uh, and then the 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 target, some of the targets, or some of the main areas that uh, the parties try to focus their attention on. Obviously, is the global goal on the adaptation, so, uh, and then uh, there are various other uh, uh, different topics. But those are the main ones, 
I would think. And uh, if each one of those that I mentioned, they have different sub teams or sub groupings that come together from both the parties non -par and, and non-party stakeholders and beyond, including now more and more the private sector, um, the youth associations, the civil society organizations, they all, and this is extremely important and very important in the sense that uh, if many of you who have been to the COPS, these things can seem very disjointed and uh, going in different directions, but seeing, seeing it from within, what I felt was very important that is that they all provide a very important eco chamber for the negotiations, for the negotiators that are there uh, during COP and throughout the year, during intersessional, the subsidiary body meetings and various other uh, bodies of the UNFCCC that they get together tr throughout the year. So that is very, very important. But once again, going back to my first point, it all needs to come together in some sort of com coherent, integrated work plan. And that is something that I have been advocating. Now, very briefly also on the politics, because we cannot uh, talk about climate change without the politics surrounding uh, climate change negotiations and the geopolitics uh, that surround uh, such negotiations and in, in the multilateral world. And the biggest divide in the in, in the political scene is obviously the north-south, the developed versus developing, Annex 1, Annex 2. Uh, those, those are the divides, and they are very clearly manifested uh, uh, within the negotiations at every level. And that has been the case since the beginning of times, beginning of uh, the UNFCCC more than 30 years ago. And the most important, one of the most important criteria or concept within those divides is the CBDR, the common but di differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. And that gets, that, that uh, plays out uh, very, very strongly and uh, has very important groundings uh, with regard to adaptation because the parties, for, especially from the global south, are very, very strong on demanding uh, adequate support, funding, capacity building, technology, and so on for adaptation. Whereas the developed countries, they tend to focus more on mitigation. And that, that, that divide cuts across all the negotiations, negotiating tracks, and you see that at different levels. And it becomes very uh, complex, but at the same time, very interesting because then uh, there are different ways of connecting those negotiations uh, to see where the offsets are, how to negotiate, and where to uh, lower the expectations and raise the expectations in relation to something else that is being negotiated and what what is what is the most important at that time and so on. And then within that, as you all know, there are so many different negotiating groups. And I'll tell you why I'm focusing on all of that or, or pro, uh, listing or giving you the landscape. The negotiating groups, as uh, we know, G77 and China, which is the biggest, uh, um, comprising of more than 100 parties from the global south plus China and the African group, the Arab states, uh, environmental integrity group, the European Union, the umbrella group. Uh, and then there are some of uh, some smaller ones, which which are extremely important. ILAC is one of those, uh, ABU, ALBA, BASIC, and so on. The LDC, SIDS. <clears throat> so these are all the negotiating groups. And those are, uh, I have experienced, they can be very effective, at times very powerful. Uh, so engaging with those negotiating groups at different, le at, at, at different levels, especially at the chairs and uh, vice chairs and co-chairs level is very, very important. But what does all that uh, myriad of adaptation landscape mean for adaptation and then what the boundary organizations can and should do in that sort of uh, varied and diverse landscape that I just highlighted? Uh, in order to accelerate climate adaptation uh, and and the various aspects that we need to work on. At this juncture, let me also pause a bit and then reflect on what we are hearing 
uh, in in the news, uh, the recent UNEP GAP report, and I think today also the uh, UNEP Triple C put out the uh, synthesis report on where uh, the uh, global warming is at this stage, and this usually happens before the COP to inform the policymakers, the negotiators, the heads of states and government, and the situation is quite stark. It's very bad. It's <laughs> It's it's quite uh, alarming <clears throat> because we are looking at shooting three degrees uh, by the end of the century, and we already way beyond I think one point three by some estimates, by some uh, records, we may have even breached one point five. Depends on where, but uh, quite aside the limits or the thresholds, we are seeing the impacts of it everywhere. And as we all know, climate change, the impacts of climate change does not respect any boundaries. And we're seeing those devastations and impacts in almost all parts of the world as we speak. And the, they are becoming more intense, more, uh, more critical, more damaging. And to overlay that with the geopolitics, the wars and the global tensions that we are seeing in different parts of the world, it makes it even worse. And as I always uh, used to say and still do, climate change is a threat multiplier. If you take any of those geopolitical, global, multilateral issues uh, and then overlay uh, that with the climate change, it just multiplies that many, many fold. So it's very critical, essential to address the root causes of climate change and then uh, and I, and as I mentioned, we are already beyond 1.3 degrees uh, uh, Celsius. So mitigation can only take us so far. So I think adaptation, well, I believe adaptation is necessary, essential, advisable, desirable, and so on, uh, wherever. And in that, here is uh, something which I'd like to highlight and emphasize uh, when we talk about, uh, talk about adaptation is the need to reach the farthest first those who are at the farthest uh, spectrum of the impacts of climate change and that I'm talking about people in the uh, low-lying islands, uh, LDCs, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and many other parts of the world which are underdeveloped and are already going through major crises, uh, both man-made and, and natural disasters. So the adaptation measures should reach to them first, and then we can work backwards from there. So reach the farthest first. That is that is extremely important. Thank you. And uh, the role of boundary organization, I believe it's very, very critical. I've been involved in a few of those. Uh, some might argue IPCC is one of those. Uh, uh, and bringing the scientific and the policy making nexus uh, or reflecting on that is extremely important because the whole the, the entire climate change process is is guided by driven by or even driven by scientific evidence and ipcc is the premier body that provides that scientific basis and there are many other offshoots of that uh, uh, in different parts of the world. The, the one which I've been recently uh, more involved in is the International Cryosphere, Climate Cryosphere Initiative, ICCI, which many of you would know. And until I got involved in that, uh, uh, it, was quite, it was quite revealing and an eye-opener for me that uh, what is happening in cryosphere, that is Arctic, Antarctic, permafrost, glaciers, mountains, sea ice, and all of that, the situation there is terrible and i've been to some of those places and seen the impacts of that first and myself uh and believe it or not i think what's happening in those in 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 that, those planetary systems is four times worse than what we are experiencing in other parts of the world so the global warming is actually four four times uh more extreme in those places and that is resulting in enormous uh, melting of ice uh losing of uh glacial cover uh, that is pro pro protecting and then inversely that is emitting more greenhouse gas emissions including methane which has been trapped for millennia so that is very very serious and we are not sort of uh, looking at that and uh, seeing that so ICCI is one initiative that they get together and bring 
extremely prominent and very well versed scientists on the one hand and negotiators and policymakers on the other and try to bring them together and share that knowledge, share that information, highlight the urgency and try to, uh, and there are many other such organizations I wouldn't want to name. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I, would, I would suggest that, that we, we, we leave it at this. This is a wonderful uh, example that you've given. Um, also highlighting how everything is, is connected and what happens in the Arctic has an effect on many other parts of the world. You've made a very strong case for the role of boundary organizations. Um, and we will have more opportunity to go in in depth during during the discussion. Uh, and I hope you'll be able to uh, uh, to 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 join us until until the end of of the webinar. Sure. Um, we will now have three speakers who will speak from their experience and their particular region. Um, Katie Harris, Rajesh Shapir, and Philomena Nelson. Um, after that, we will have a first round of audience Q&A, uh, also including OVAS, and then we'll have two more discussions uh, followed again by audience Q&A. Um, let me briefly introduce Katie Harris. Um, she is a senior policy fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute and also director of the Global Partnership Adaptation Without Borders. Katie, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, thank you so much Richard um, and uh, it's really a delight to be here today and I'm going to put my timer on because I've been uh, told very strictly to keep to time. We've got a lot of really fantastic uh, panellists for you today uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction into how we at SEI um, coordinate our strategic policy engagement on, uh, on climate change and for climate action. Uh, so a bit of a behind the scenes look at uh, some of the practices, some of the processes, some of the principles we employ, um, and then a quick example at the end. Thanks, Alicia. Great. So uh, we have at SEI a strategic policy engagement program. Uh, so we have a dedicated program that aims to maximize SEI's impact in a number of different forums and processes that are particularly important for decisions on and the implementation of sustainable development. So we have currently three thematic tracks, and that's in addition to a number of regional focus tracks. One of those is on climate change, uh, another is on oceans and biodiversity, and a third at the moment is on the 2030 agenda and financing for development. And I coordinate uh, along with uh, my partner in crime, Maya Rebermark, uh, our strategic policy engagement program on climate change. And these three programs uh, broadly aim to so play a role coordinating and facilitating. So we try to ensure that relevant SEI expertise is really brought to bear on these different forums and processes as they relate to our priorities for change. Those are outlined in our um, strategy. We aim to build capacity. So we aim to contribute to raising skills and knowledge when it comes to policy engagement in these different forums and processes right across SEI. And we work across all of SEI's uh, different centers around the world. And we represent and lead. So we decide some SEI priorities for us, uh, for, the, for the Institute, and then we engage uh, according to external demand, according to moving agendas in policy and practice, and we play a role in, in maintaining some of SEI's key relationships and networks uh, in that regard, as well as exploring new um, venues and networks for engagement as they arise. So the key aim of SP Climate, uh, which is our shorthand for this program, is to really strengthen the Institute's engagement with global policy agendas on climate change in ways that really leverage and increase the impact of our research. And we have a dedicated team and a budget to do that. We're very lucky in that regard. Uh, we devise a three-year strategy, and then we devise an annual operational work plan that has three sets of activities. Next slide, please, Alicia. So the first of those three activities. Uh, so we aim to strengthen SEI's engagement 
with climate policy agendas and processes at the global level and our visibility and impact around global climate moments. And our role is really to transcend all of the different uh, individual research projects that we have at SEI. So we identify each year four or five climate policy agendas and processes that offer important opportunities for uh, SEI's engagement. We then coordinate and communicate our work and our expertise to inform and influence those processes. And we really try and harness some of the big international climate policy moments towards that end. And we don't only focus on the UNFCCC, but we also look at uh, summits and events throughout the year uh, beyond the climate change negotiations. Next slide, please, Alicia. So to do this, some of the activities that we do, thought this might be useful to run through. So we play a role, horizon scanning, reading briefings and newsletters, engaging in climate networks, groups and forums to really understand what is the context for policy engagement? What are some of the constraints and opportunities that we face? Um, and so we'll then write up sort of what does this external context look like for us? Uh, so I've just included at each point some excerpts from our a work plan that we did from last year uh, as it relates to adaptation, uh, in case that's useful for you to see. Also, we then try and articulate as concretely as possible some aims and objectives. So we identify and cultivate policy propositions, entry points, and map desired outcomes and success indicators. So this involves really trying to pin down and be as targeted as possible. What policy outcome are we working towards? And therefore, what policy processes are we aiming to engage with or, or inform and influence? And what would our desired impacts look like? So uh, again, from last year, we were really aiming um, for the development of a framework on the global goal on adaptation. So a very specific policy process at the international level uh, that Ove's just talked about, but that accounts for transboundary climate risks. That was our niche and that's what we were aiming for. Uh, next slide, please, Alicia. Then we conduct audience mapping and analysis, who aligns with our view, who do we need to engage with and target, uh, what relationships do we need to foster or partnerships to strengthen, what forums and day-to-day -day discussions need to, do we need to participate in. Um, we often use ODI's really interesting and helpful tool, it's called the AIM matrix, so I just wanted to give a little plug for that. And then we play a role to trying to define some key outputs and outreach activities. So we ask like, what research can we contribute to, to inform these processes? What sort of outputs should we develop? Uh, in what formats, via what dissemination channels? And we try and deploy a range of those throughout the year. Some of those might be behind the scenes, running roundtables and consultations. Some of those might be much more public, such as digital products or op-eds and so forth. And we both look at existing um, outputs that are planned in our funded research projects, but also what new outputs we might need to devise and de develop to uh, really help engage with that policy process. Next slide, please, Olivia. We then identify key moments. We build our timeline for the year. So critical moments when we need to be, uh, when we can be influencing. Um, what moments we might choose to, to run events, help build our profile, but also convene some of those actors that are really critical within that policy process. We work with researchers to develop policy relevant messaging and really trying to distill clear, realistic and implementable recommendations. Um, and I've just given an example of uh, what we often start off with, uh, that we would, for instance, like climate adaptation to account for issues of equity and justice, but how we might then work that up into a much more concrete uh, policy recommendation on adaptation. And then we manage work plans, delivery, we look at what capacity we'll need, and we manage associated budgets. Next slide, please, Alicia. So that's the first set of activities, probably the main activities we do but we have two other activities. So first of all, we aim to uh, enhance the impact of research from across SEI uh, as it's relevant to international, regional and national climate policy agendas and to account for emerging issues or agendas or opportunities that we couldn't have foreseen at the beginning of the year. 
And we do this through managing a quick response fund. This allows us to pivot funding and capacity towards activities um, that we didn't plan for at the outset. And all researchers can apply for a small set of a really small amount, maybe enough to produce an op-ed uh, or a policy submission, um, but that allows us to be a bit more reactive and on our toes. And then next slide, please, Alicia. And then we also play a role in basically strengthening SEI's internal information flows and coordination and collaboration across our centres. So I've just listed uh, some of the activities that we do. I'm not going to run through all of these in detail because we'll share this PowerPoint afterwards with you. But we do things like planning, uh, hosting sort of COP sessions across SEI, um, having mid-year follow-ups to see how the lay of the land has changed, uh, working with our communications teams. Next slide, please, Alicia. And running quarterly briefings with staff, with staff doing information sharing, um, liaising with UNFCCC, and so on. So then in my final minute, <laughs> it's a really quick whistle-stop tour. Next slide, please. Wanted to give you one example of what we do with Adaptation Without Borders. Um, and basically last year, we got a really great policy win. Um, in, in our mind, we got um, some decision text coming out of COP28, um, two decisions that reflected um, that climate risks are transboundary in nature. One of those in decision one was in light in relation to the global stock take. And the second one was in relation to the global goal on adaptation. So this was a policy win for us. But as the next slide will show, in fact, the next two slides, this came about was a result of five years of work at a two year dedicated work program uh, to try and achieve this. We did uh, a lot of policy-oriented research and evidence um, to equip decision makers with the information they'd need on transboundary climate risks. We did a lot of national and regional engagement with negotiators and adaptation planners and policy makers across the different continents to sort of lay the groundwork for this and understand their needs and capacities and potential response options. And then we had some really dedicated work streams on these two policy processes under the UNFCCC. So we did uh, some very targeted briefs where we where we basically called for this decision text. Uh, we participated in a number of workshops and technical dialogues. Next slide, please, Alicia. We had a really significant presence at the intercessionals, so the meeting of the subsidiary bodies halfway through the year. We did a number of webinars and roundtables, and we published several perspectives. And there was just a quote from the end when we did our rapid impact assessment that uh, I think it's important to say we were really seen by others as being champion of these issues. Um, but as well as filling a gap, it was also seemed to complement uh, sort of the work of others and the perspectives of others. And that's really what we aimed to cultivate throughout uh, those two years that we were um, being a voice for, for many uh, people across the world uh, who felt that we should um, be accounting for transboundary climate risks in our adaptation policy work. Final slide, just to say, I would say before Richard boots me off, um, Lessons learned, be prepared to focus uh, really on a minute, what can seem at times like a minute uh, policy process, but it's really important. Stay with it for the long term and build lasting relationships. And you may even make a friend or two along the way, uh, many of whom are in this call today. Thanks so much. Back to you, Richard. Look forward to lots of questions in the chat. Thank, thank you, Katie. This was this was really excellent. We go straight to Bayesha Fu, who is the director of 4C Maroc, which stands for Centre de Compétence Changement Climatique, which is the Centre of Excellence of Climate Change, which has been set up in Morocco. And Raje will talk about how 4C Maroc approaches strategic policy engagement at the local to national level in Morocco. So what's yours, Raje? Thank you very much, Mr. Klein. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Raja Shafil, Executive Director of the Climate Change Competencies Center for C Morocco. I'm happy to be given the opportunity to discuss and exchange with all of you today. Special thanks to the Stockholm Environmental Institute for organizing this interesting webinar and for their kind invitation. 
and to Uranus for all their efforts and leadership to support the INBOA network. My presentation today will focus on the organization that I have the pleasure of leading. I will try to show how its implementation was in itself a way to strengthen strategic policy engagement at different levels and to give you an overview of what we've been doing since our inception support its outsells. Uh, next, please. For C Morocco has been set up in 2016 as a platform for dialogue and capacity building set up to support national stakeholders in engaging in designing and implementing climate policies with the aim of ultimately to accelerate climate action in Morocco and in Africa. For C Morocco is a non-profit public interest group, which is not a common legal status here in Morocco. So what does it mean practically? We bring together more than 40 members from various uh, backgrounds, including the public and the private sectors, the scientific research community, civil society, and local authorities. All our members sit on our board and our works. Uh, our work is to uh, uh, partly uh, funded uh, by their yearly financial contribution. In exchange, we're in charge of uh, uh, accomplishing the following four missions for their benefit. Four missions, strengthening their capacities. Second, developing decision-making tools. Uh, third, making information and knowledge on climate change and climate action accessible and exploitable. And uh, uh, fourth, uh, coordinating networks of experts and relevant stakeholders. You might wonder, how do we work with so many members? For Simoroko and Counterpass, four platforms, the, the public sector and territories platform, the private sector platform, the scientific research, and the civil society platforms. These platforms are networks bringing together actors from, from the same background and aim to represent the main categories of climate change stakeholders in Morocco. These four platforms structure allows uh, us to promote dialogue and exchange within each network of actors, but more importantly, between the four of them. This, in turn, encourages ownership of our work and consequently policy engagement. Uh, first uh, slide, please. Uh, so next slide. As you can see here, our action is implemented through five work programs. I will focus on uh, only two today. Program two, support for climate change mainstreaming in development policies, and the program three, partnership and local climate action. Both programs aim to strengthen policy engagement at both national and local level. Next slide, please. How do we support strategic political engagement to climate action at the local level? As said previously, our unique institutional and legal status allow us to main maintain constant dialogue with local authorities' representatives that oversee the development and implementation of local development strategies. This allows us to be aware of local authorities' needs and adapt our offer. Based on that, Forci Morocco provides technical support in local development plans design, in accessing climate finance, in modeling climate vulnerability, and in building the capacities of local elected officials and executives. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Our work at the local level isn't limited to local authorities' representatives. We work with local communities and local NGOs to strengthen their involvement and role in climate policy design and implementation. As an example, we have worked since uh, 2021 to model and promote local community initiatives 
and practices, including through the development of an, an online platform. These initiatives are a valuable source uh, of information and know-how thanks to their participatory approach that uh, efficiently address the priorities of the most vulnerable population in the ground. Next, please. We also work with civil society organizations, both at national and local levels, to build their, uh, their advocacy skills and make sure they can influence public policy process to strengthen their capacities on a wide range of topics like climate finance, climate negotiations, mainstreaming climate change in local planning, etc., and supporting them in publishing white papers and memorandums. Next, please. Another important group of actors we consider crucial to successful strategic political engagement are universities and research institutions. Uh, the next, you can, you can put next, please, to have the text. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Forsi Morocco has, in the last uh, couple of years, worked to take stock of the various climate change-related research projects being carried out in Morocco and to promote their results within the public decision-making sphere. We believe a strong science policy, policy interface uh, is essential to impactful, long-lasting, sustainable adaptation to climate change. Next, please. Next uh, text, yeah, thank you. Uh, one of the ways uh, we do that is by developing our own publications. These are always based on a robust scientific literature review and will privilege national sources. Uh, the idea here is to act as a mediator between scientific knowledge and policy makers. We make sure, uh, sure uh, the policy briefs uh, we publish uh, are exploitable by the users we're targeting. On the screen, you can see some of the topics we've uh, tackled in the last couple of years, selected uh, based on our members' emergency needs, like uh, financing uh, loss and damage, uh, new development model, gender mainstreaming in climate action, border carbon adjustment mechanism, and green jobs in Africa, and the fight against climate change. I'm now done with my presentation, and I thank you for your attention. I will be happy to answer any question and exchange with you uh, later during the, the webinar. Thank you again, Mr. Klein. I'm giving you back the floor. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, our next speaker um, is from the South Pacific, the South Pacific Regional Environment Program, SPREP. And Philomena will talk about how SPREP approaches strategic policy engagement of climate change across the Pacific. And thank you so much for staying awake for so late. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Richard. I hope you can hear me. Um, and thank yes. you as well for the opportunity um, for SPREP to speak at this webinar. Um, next slide, please. The Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program, it's uh, an intergovernmental organization established by Pacific governments 31 years ago. And we have been given a mandate um, to protect and manage the environment and natural resources in the Pacific region, in Pacific countries and territories, including um, responses to climate change. Um, the just in 2022, um, our leaders have always said that climate change is the single greatest, uh, greatest existing threat to our Pacific. And in 2022, and I'm sure you've seen this um, on many communication channels, 2022, our Pacific leaders declare a climate emergency in the Pacific region. Um, that threatens the livelihoods, the security, the well-being of our Pacific people and, and ecosystems. 
Um, just in the same year, uh, our leaders also approved uh, one of the key regional frameworks in the region, and that is the 2050 strategy for the uh, Blue Pacific continent. And I've included the links in my presentation uh, for uh, further reading later on. Uh, but before the 2050 strategy was endorsed, um, the framework for resilient development in the Pacific, which is a, an integrated uh, framework to address climate change and disaster risk management, uh, based on the recognition that there's a lot of synergies between climate change and disaster risk management. Again, I've included the link for that um, for further reading later on. And that's a, the, these are the key uh, frame, frameworks at the regional level to try and coordinate the work in the Pacific region as well, noting the challenges that we face as small island states, not just from the impacts of climate change and other issues, but also um, the issues around uh, capacity limitations uh, in, in individual countries in the region, and also access to resources to support the implementation of priorities. Next slide, please. Um, so the work of SPREP, we work directly with national governments, given our um, mandate. Uh, we work directly with national climate change focal points on mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, UNFCCC negotiations, capacity building, and other areas to help uh, countries to uh, implement their national uh, climate change priorities. But we also work with uh, National Meteorological and Hydrological Services um, to help them improve their observation systems, their capacity uh, to operate and analyze data from those observation systems. We help them with uh, their work on climate science and turning those um, climate science in, into information services to help improve their end -to -end early warning systems for both weather and climate. And we also support them in their engagement uh, through the IPCC process. We, as an organization, um, we also access technical assistance to help our Pacific countries and territories to develop and support implementation of na national climate change policies and strategies. <clears throat> You've noted there that I'm included uh, territories um, because of their um, status, um, under the UNFCCC, we are unable to access climate finance to help them address their climate change issues. But we try and, and look for opportunities through technical assistance directly from uh, the Secretariat to help them develop their national resilience uh, frameworks or, or climate change policies. Um, as a regional accredited entity to the Green Climate Fund and Adaptation Fund, uh, we access uh, finance to help our countries as well uh, to implement their priorities under their national determined contributions as well as, uh, as well as their adaptation priorities. And this is for the 14 uh, Pacific uh, parties to the UNFCCC. Uh, we are currently working with uh, four Pacific countries to develop um, their national adaptation plans. Um, and also in uh, supporting them in, you know, implementing some of the key priorities that they've identified under their NDCs, the current NDCs. We support civic countries as well and territories in building capacity in climate change areas, depending on their priorities, whether it's government agencies, we work with civil society organization. We also um, invite private sector, um, you know, community-based organizations or faith-based organizations. We have an um, online training portal, and this was developed when COVID happened, when we were unable to go into our member countries to actually deliver training. And so we developed this training portal whereby participants um, can then join online training as well. Um, through our Pacific Climate Change Center, which is part of the Climate Change Resilience Program in the Secretariat, um, we look at uh, innovative solutions to, um, for adaptation and mitigation. Just in 2022, the Pacific Climate Change Center run a virtual exhibition of innovative solutions, um, in particular from those countries that have similar situations um, like the Pacific countries. Um, and, and there's some really great ideas 
that have come out of that um, uh, virtual exhibition that the Pacific Climate Change Center is looking into piloting into some of our countries. We also um, run the Pacific Climate Change Portal, which is to provide and share information to a number of stakeholders from government and civil society, private sector and others. But we also support national climate change focal points in developing their own national climate change portals and also help them look for financing to help them translate those into local languages as well. Because if people don't understand what's on those portals, they won't be able to use that information. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the UN, um, the negotiations, uh, we also support our national focal points or climate change focal points in the negotiations. The 14 Pacific states that are parties to the UNFCCC, we help them um, understand the, the, the issues before they go into the bond session, before before going into COP. We undertake deep dive sessions throughout the year on specific specific priorities. Uh, we run the pavilion for the Pacific. We run the media campaign on the 1.5 uh, degrees to stay alive. Uh, but we also support Pacific political champions on various thematic priorities. For example, this year we have seven political champions uh, who will be attending COP this year um, on various uh, thematic priorities. But we also run um, some trainings um, in collaboration with partners uh, to to strengthen the capacity of Pacific states negotiators, um, including um, you know, training new negotiators as well. Next slide, please. I just want to take a deep dive into um, adaptation. Based on the uh, the the LTC lake. Um, guideline. We have a uh, we adapted that guideline to contextualize it, um, uh, uh, taking into consideration the the issues and the special circumstances and the challenges of the Pacific region. Uh, this guideline was developed back in twenty twenty one, and this is the one that we are using at this stage to help the countries that are currently developing national adaptation plans. Um, at the moment, we um, only five Pacific states have submitted NAPs to the UNFCCC. The remaining nine are at different stages of development, uh, of developing the adaptation uh, plans. I've also included the link there for the guideline for any further reading um, later on. Next slide, please. Um, I want to focus a little bit on this because I think this is quite important, at least from the Pacific uh, perspective. Um, as I mentioned, um, SPRIF as an accredited entity and also a delivery partner is access, accessing um, adaptation financing from the GCF to support uh, four of our countries in developing their national adaptation plans. Um, in addition to that, other than accessing finance, we provide technical advice uh, to our countries, to all our 14 parties uh, through the focal points on, on potential approaches to design and develop adaptation planning frameworks and action plans, noting the challenges that we have in the region in terms of capacity and resources to do things in our countries. What we have done is that we've used this opportunity to update climate projections um, in our countries. Um, and also downscaling it at sector level, because that needs to be understood well at the sector level as well. Um, and and um, um, and update climate impact, vulnerability and risk assessment, because the, the information from past uh, climate impact, vulnerability and risk assessment are, are out of date. And so we are using this opportunity to update all of that, taking into consideration uh, the findings from uh, the, late, the latest um, IPCC special report, AR6. And based on these findings from, from these assessments, we, the, the stakeholders and communities and governments and, and all the key, uh, key stakeholders in countries, they come together to look at the, uh, look at the findings from SIVRA, which is the acronym that we use, and, and then discuss what are the 
adaptation options that could work for the different outer islands or communities, um, looking at um, um, you know longevity of those options, look at the impacts, look at how they're going to implement that realistically, given the, the issues that they face on a day-to-day -day basis on the ground. Uh, adaptation options are then appraised and prioritized by the stakeholders in those communities, in those sectors. The prioritized, prioritized adaptation options are then costed, um, um, which of course is, in, is included in the NAP. As part of the process that we look at issues and challenges to, um, to also, you know, to implement adaptation, which um, actions that have been identified and looking at some of the strategies or solutions to address these challenges as part of the implementation of the National Adaptation Plan. NAPs are then socialized and, lo and launched, and of course it has to be adopted by their cabinets in each of these countries before it is finally submitted to the UNFCCC. One of the key things that we've um, uh, heard from our countries is that all these documents, whether it's a policy or a plan, have been developed and sitting on their shelves collecting dust. So what we've done is that instead of just developing a NAP, we also develop bankable concept notes to access finance to implement their national adaptation plans, focusing on their key priorities. Next slide. Uh, okay, thank you. The, uh, the approach that we are using um, is that we engage one organization or one um, firm, uh, and we are working with um, um, the, con uh, the, uh, the, the CSIRO, which is a scientific organization in Australia. Um, and it's one of our key partners in the region when it comes to climate science. And the reason why, and the reason for doing this is because one method is developed to assess climate impacts, vulnerability and risk. And this helps us to do comparisons between these findings, I mean, uh, with these findings uh, between countries, yeah? And also help us identify common adaptation actions that we can package uh, to access climate finance from, from, from you know, GCF or, or adaptation fund or other bilateral uh, donors as well as technical uh, assistance that could really help uh, catalyze adaptation actions on the ground. Next slide, please. Maybe you can um, begin to wrap up for a minute. Yeah, that's my last slide actually. Perfect. Um, I wanted to um, bring this as well, um, the work that we are doing um, in terms of addressing loss and damage. Um, we have uh, held, and the reason why I'm bringing this in, I know this, the focus is on adaptation, but we also have to look at ad adaptation limits. Adaptation remains a key priority for the region, but we've started to look at um, loss and damage. How can we uh, respond to some of these issues? We have held a regional dialogue on loss and damage because of the issues around um, loss and damage being different from country to country, island to island, even within those islands between provinces and clans and families and all of that. Uh, we provide support to the uh, Pacific States representative uh, on the board for, for the fund, as well as the SITS rep on the, the, the Santiago Network Advisory Board as well. We also look at financing opportunities and we have access finance from New Zealand as well as the government of Germany to help our countries to start building evidence base with particular focus on non-economic loss and damage and also look at where adaptation limits have been experienced um, and also supporting them in having their national dialogues to really define what loss and damage means to them, looking at policy integration or policy interventions, testing some of those responses that is fit for purpose based on their circumstances and their situation on the ground and also looking for funding, uh, developing funding proposals to access further financing, training our media as well in each of these countries and at the regional level to be able to speak about loss and damage and be able to tell the story of the Pacific region. And of course, bringing in our youth as well. And I think um, that is my last uh, slide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh...
Philomena. Um, this was a really rich overview uh, from three different parts of the world uh, on how uh, boundary organizations work uh, and what their priorities are and, and how they engage with policy. Uh, we're a little bit behind of schedule, but if there are a few questions, you can either type them in the chat or raise your hand, and then Alicia will uh, grant you the privilege of speaking through uh, the microphone. Um, but you can also, I, I think that is one question already from uh, Caroline Larivé in the chat. Um, three panelists have shown how the work done by boundary organizations plays a crucial role towards developing a structured, coherent, integrated work plan for adaptation. And then a question, how could they benefit from working more closely together and learning from each other and help shape such a work plan at a more global level? In other words, what would be the value of a network of like in BOA and how could the boundary organizations make a total more than the sum of its parts? Any of the speakers who would like to would like to address this question? I, I could briefly reflect on Please that. Yes. yes, I think that's a very pertinent question. And as I mentioned also in my remarks, uh, it's important to have that coherent, coordinated and integrated approach. So I think uh, more specifically, knowledge sharing, collaboration, partnership between the different boundary organizations will be the most important way of doing it. And then use of digital technology that is now available to all of us. Uh, I think enhancing the use or capitalizing of that would be one way of uh, making that happen between the different organizations. Right, Philomena, you would like to uh, come in as well? Uh, yes, thank you, Richard. And I think, <laughs> I think um, um, it's been mentioned on partnership knowledge sharing because that's important for the region as well. Uh, to learn from other regions, what other organizations are doing in other countries, uh, in particular those who in similar situation in Pacific, uh, Pacific states. Um, the, what our organization is doing, we collaborate with uh, uh, academic institutions as well um, and, and, and look for further opportunities to, to, uh, to work with other organizations in other regions of the world because we don't have all the solutions in our region, but what's important, we look at what's working in other regions, in other small island states, uh, for example, in the Caribbean, and see how that can be applied, maybe tailored a little bit um, to help our countries as well, but also opportunities to engage for, the, for our countries, for our member countries to engage directly with those organizations um, through, through partnerships with the Secretary. Thanks. Thank, thanks for that. I think this is this is really uh, uh, helpful, and and I think you know, in Boa being such a, a new organization, it it can certainly uh, benefit from these experiences and and suggestions. Um, I see one more question from Roger uh, Street, uh, who enjoyed the presentations, and I would like to follow on a question from Caroline: Are there specific innovations that have been introduced? And could be shared. In addition, are there some critical challenges that these organizations are experiencing which they could benefit from exploring the challenges and potential innovations that others have introduced? Katie, innovations and challenges before we go to the next speaker. Just very briefly, I think um, from my perspective at SEI, I think one of the challenges we face is attracting funding uh, to, to fund our work long term um, on policy engagement on on all kinds of climate action adaptation and mitigation. Uh, I think it can be very hard, especially for smaller organizations uh, who receive sort of, you know, project based funding to have enough of a long term horizon for that funding to be able to sustain some of these long, long term relationships to be able to invest in these policy processes and engage in them over the long term. And I really do think that that's, that's a challenge. Um, so that's one, one challenge I would see. And another challenge is, um, I guess, 
you know, I, I sit in a role, I'm a senior policy fellow, but a lot of the the work that uh, I profile and promote uh, is, is based on others across the Institute. We have sort of, I don't know how many uh, head count we're up to at the moment, but uh, across hundreds of people around the world. Um, and uh, I, I feel that, you know, for a lot of boundary organizations, they're filled with these incredible scholars, these academics, these people who are generating sort of real academic excellence, but it can be critical for, for there to be roles like mine that can that can work with those individuals to then really package and present the work uh, in ways that are useful to policymakers at the right time, at the right moment. Um, and uh, I guess that's a challenge that we could all benefit from if we were able to share our skills, share our experience, um, share, share our tools and tactics that would be um, incredibly beneficial because it's not always an easy job uh, and sometimes those in roles like mine are very much operating alone in their organizations. Uh, thanks, thanks, so thanks much. Katie. And um, Pleasure, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, one of uh, uh, our uh, uh, more uh, most innovative action is the creation of the African Climate Academy uh, in Forsi, Morocco. Aware of the importance of uh, young people's uh, participation and involvement in climate action, Forsi, Morocco has uh, implemented a wide range of activities aimed at uh, building the capacities and empower, uh, empowering uh, young people. The African Climate Academy created by the Forsi Morocco is indubitably the center's uh, flagship action uh, in, in terms of capacity building for young uh, people in the uh, field of climate change uh, in Morocco and in Africa. And it aims to create a, a breeding uh, ground uh, for Moroccan and African experts capable of uh, uh, meeting the, the continent's needs uh, in the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, like, uh, for example, adaptation, uh, loss and damage, etc. Thank you. Uh, perfect. So, of course, highlighting yet another important role that boundary organizations have in terms of training and, and capacity building. Thank, thank you to the one, speaker. One more, one more uh, initiative that I should mention, if you've not looked at, uh, take a look at the resilience frontiers of uh, within the adaptation program of UNFCCC, uh, extremely uh, relevant and quite an innovative approach. Uh, so take a look. I think it, you you should be able to find that on on. I can I can second that. One of the most exciting pavilions at the UNFCCC. Absolutely. Um, we move on to two speakers who um, will, um, from their perspective, um, uh, comment on the work that boundary organisations could do and how they could uh, inform and influence policy making. The first is Maria. Del Pilar Bueno, who um, is with CONICET, which is the Argentine National Council for Scientific and Technological Research. And she's also with the municipality of Rosario and has a long history in the UNFCCC. Maria, it's a pleasure to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Richard. It's also my pleasure to uh, be here. And um, let me know if I can share my screen or you are going to, do you have my slides? Yeah, thank you very much. So um, I would like to uh, share with you some, some key opportunities in particular associated with, with COP29 uh, in Baku. Um, of course, all this is is uh, part of of the of the work and the power of of the network. Uh, in particular, of of this hub, I have the opportunity to to participate in uh, trying to build uh, more bridges between global north and global south uh, in adaptation and being very focused on. Um, the key priorities and high level priorities for, for this COP. Let's go to, to the next one, please. Um, 
this is a, a very short presentation since I, I really wanted to, to focus on and wanted to be strategic in terms of, of how we are understanding as a network that um, we need to be uh, quite focused on this COP. We know this COP is a finance COP. Um, all um, the world is focused on NCQG discussions. That is a new um, financial goal. So uh, it's very important for, for us from our perspective really to, to understand um, the importance of having two separate goals, both in adaptation and loss and damage. Uh, of course, uh, the quality of the finance, not only the quantum, both of them are quite as strategic as well as um, in terms of methodologies and goals to really separate um, what, what uh, countries are providing, both in adaptation and loss and damage, because we have already seen some um, double counting there and we need to avoid that. At the same time, and we see that in current um, draft, um, the importance of having clear linkages between the, the UAE framework, that is um, the framework on the global goal on adaptation launched last year in Dubai. So to really build uh, very clear relationships between the, the 11 targets um, adopted last year and the new climate goal. Um, this cannot be separate because then we will have uh, a framework with targets and indicators, but really not support or not clear provisions and support for adaptation for those 11 targets, including the, the adaptation cycle and the seven ones in terms of thematic targets. So we also um, see very clear opportunities to focus on other issues on, on adaptation finance, such as the replenishment of the adaptation fund that last year really uh, didn't uh, work as expected, considering a fund that really is uh, very important for developing countries and is doing a very good job in order to develop um, transformative um, actions and adaptation with small grants for, for developing countries. Um, of course, there is also the discussion on doubling adaptation finance. Um, this is a, um, a compromise uh, of, of Glasgow, of COP26. Um, we understand this is very important as part of the package, but at the same time, um, science is very clear and, and also policy with respect to um, inefficient, insufficient uh, provision associated with doubling adaptation finance uh, in comparison with needs. And um, I'm referring in particular to the adaptation gap report and many other reports uh, that are showing that uh, the increase in needs of developing countries included in different adaptation related documents, their NAPs, their NDCs, their adaptation communications and, and other instruments. Um, and we will also see that this year in terms of the BTRs, probably you know that we have this year the, the deadline for the submission of the biennial transparency reports, the first reporting instruments for in order to close this first ambition cycle under the Paris Agreement. So it's very good to have already Andorra, Guyana, and Panama uh, with adaptation and loss and damage components. Um, at the same time, we saw that it's difficult really to have so close for many reasons and also for adaptation in particular, and of course for loss and damage too. Um, it really, uh, to see the incentives that different countries, both developed, developing countries are experiencing in order to submit an adaptation component, both in BTRs with lead deadline this year and in NDCs 3.0 with deadline next year. So what I want to say is that it's very important to build those incentives for ambition, considering the ex-ante component of NDCs and the ex-post component or and reporting considerations of BTRs, um, and I'm talking both on global and, and uh, global north and global south because for a lot of years only the global south was really submitting adaptation components everywhere, understanding this as a very technical and political consideration. So I think the the international community really need to see also the global north leadership with respect to adaptation components in both. Um, in both uh, documents. 
With respect to the GDA in particular, uh, you uh, may know that experts are already working on the mapping exercise in the context of the first year of the work program on indicators on the UAE framework. Um, and this is a very good news as well as the, the very good engagement. Right now we have more than 9,000 indicators, uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of uh, challenges associated with this number and the criteria. Uh, so we really need very specific mandates this year with respect to finalizing the mapping exercise with this criteria, having a new mandate for new indicators um, with this refining down. Uh, we don't have very good perspectives on um, means of implementation indicators are there, are part of the 9,000, but uh, criteria is not clear. And we have a purpose, uh, as this is part of the purpose of the UAE framework, both action and support. So this is very critical in this scope to really understand um, how countries can really have uh, a clear mandate for the second year of the work program, uh, may, may, making clear the relationship between action and support uh, indicators in the context of NCQG discussion too. So also, of course, the activities and the relationship between the different stakeholders, experts and parties, as well as uh, the outcome that we are uh, understanding for next year. Next slide, and this is the last, just to say, um, also that there are other uh, critical inputs referring to the report on transformation adaptation we are expecting from the Secretariat, the discussion in, uh, in terms of where this report is fitting, because right now it's like outside of the equation. So this is also very important to consider, as well as the discussion on NAPs that really park in the SBs in June uh, in Bonn, and we really need, need to take that in consideration. And we know that the main issue is the acknowledgement of the, of the gaps in terms of finance for implementation of adaptation plans. Uh, so this is also as, um, a signal we are expecting from countries. Uh, my last point is that local uh, local opportunities included in GST decisions. So we also expect that we really can have um, good references and um, hooks in the NCQG discussions, GGA discussions with respect to uh, local governments and how uh, cities can really access also adaptation finance as for uh, their implementation. Next one and last, and uh, that's only my uh, personal information. And of course, very happy to, to continue the conversation for, um, with all of you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Pilar, and, and excellent illustration of just how much is happening, but also how fragmented it is. And it reminded me of what uh, Ovea said at the beginning, uh, that what we're lacking is really an integrated comprehensive work plan and adaptation. Um, our, our final speaker is uh, Lucy Nyuguna, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Alliance of Biodiversity International, which is linked to the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. And without further ado, Lucy, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Richard, and as fellow panelists, thank you so much for having us in this uh, webinar. So I know we only have 10 minutes left. So I think uh, just considering the time uh, pressure, I'll just build on what Pilar has just been talking about to showcase what as an organization we do, uh, more specifically in the space around uh, the global goal on adaptation and even more broadly in relation to adaptation tracking. And why we have a team in research that is focused on adaptation tracking is given that we have this um, urgent need to be able to track progress, not only at the, at the global level where we want to uh, take stock of how well we are uh, progressing towards the GGA as established by the Paris Agreement. But for us, we also recognize that to be able to track adaptation at the global level, you need also to build the capacities and methods that can actually uh, support the assessment of adaptation, even at the national and subnational level. Um, so, and this is just a small piece of work that um, the team that is listed here works on, but as an, as, a, as an organization, we have much broader work looking at uh, research and how to bring innovative solutions within tropical agriculture. Next slide. 
Um, and within this space, we focus on three main areas of work. So looking at methods, indicators and data, as well as uh, enhancing capacities to track adaptation. And this is to ensure that we can have a comprehensive approach towards advancing adaptation tracking. And also as it's shown here, um, as I said, besides looking at the global level, when it comes to discussions on the GGA, we are also work working across other skills, especially when you look at um, the needs to be able to track adaptation at the portfolio level, project level, national and regional level. Next. Um, and more specifically in relation to methods, um, and here, as I said, I'll just focus on a few examples that sort of uh, operationalize what Pilar was mentioning in terms of how we can be able to engage. So at the global level, um, well, let me start at the portfolio level. We are very keen in terms of supporting organizations in, uh, to develop robust monitoring and evaluation frameworks for their projects and also making sure that this can be brought together at a portfolio level. So you look at actors that are funding different types of adaptation projects, working with uh, various sets of uh, grantees. So then how can they be able to have coherent uh, tracking methods that can allow them to coherently uh, demonstrate how the investment, investments are contributing to adaptation. And then at a regional level, uh, more spe specifically within the African continent, we've been looking at uh, national adaptation plans and na nationally determined contributions, just to understand what type of information is included in these policy documents in relation to how well these documents can actually be able to inform a uh, robust adaptation tracking framework. And this is not only to reflect on perhaps what types of gaps already exist in these uh, documents, identifying what uh, information we can build on in these uh, NAPs and indices, but also making sure that we are surfacing this information in a way that it can be used to inform the discussions on the, on the global goal on adaptation. Uh, next. Um, and this work, especially the piece on the national uh, adaptation plans and indices, which is linked to the national scale work that we do, um, for example, when it comes to the work that Pilar has just mentioned, where we have experts that are looking at existing indicators, the mapping of existing um, elements within African NAPs and NDCs and NAPs have actually, has actually been used to inform the submissions that came in. So actually the indicators that are included in African NAPs and NDCs have been a, a, sub, a, a significant in, um, input into the uh, work that is going on on indicators because you have more than a thousand indicators that are actually coming out from this document. But when it comes to the indicators, uh, indicators work, we are also very keen to make sure that we are uh, working on reviewing what types of uh, framings of adaptation effectiveness and, um, and how this can actually be used to inform the work on developing indicators. Because typically, um, actors decide on what they want to measure and then they develop indicators based on that. But then it's important that we are reflecting on what actually different actors understand when they talk about uh, and what they mean when they talk about adaptation effectiveness to be able to then work towards developing comprehensive uh, approaches and even indicators that can be used to track adaptation. So with the various projects that we've been undertaking, uh, in addition to just looking at NAPs and indices, We've also been working with climate smart investment plans in Africa to be able to uh, surface the, the priorities that are included therein, and then using that to create repositories of indicators that different actors can refer to when they are developing their M&D frameworks. Uh, next. Uh, and the third component, if you can just, yeah. So you, the third component here is in relation to the work that uh, we are undertaking. So actually working across the work on developing methods, working on indicators, and then looking at what types of data sets we can be able to bring out uh, to comprehensively and sustainably be able to track adaptation. But we also have a major component that is basically looking at how to bring this um, work into operationalization, especially when it comes to um, strengthening the capacities of different types of actors. Um, and going again with the fact that we work across skills, it's about looking at uh, when it comes to project implementers, 
what types of uh, training and capacity building do they need for them to be able to use the different methods and tools that we are developing. Um, so we have here as an example where we are focusing on developing masterclasses that are designed to be used by different types of SMEs, um, starting from uh, showcasing how they can be able to integrate adaptation into the operation and then be able to develop uh, tracking frameworks that are aligned with their priorities. Um, but then we've also been working very closely with African negotiators, especially when it comes to helping them uh, prepare for COP negotiations, as well as the SB session on uh, agenda items that are related to the GGA. And then here at the global level, myself, I'm one of the 78 global experts that have been nominated to support the SB chairs in the work on adaptation tracking indicators. And my work specifically is on the target 9B, which looks at food and agriculture. And the main uh, part that I appreciate with working as an expert in this space and highlights the, the, the role of boundary organizations is the opportunity to be able to bring out what are the scientific elements that we actually know need to be tracked. And then also bringing to the fore, for example, our understanding of what matters at the local level for it to be able uh, to be the basis that we are using when uh, designing and refining the more than 9,000 list of indicators that we have at hand at the moment. Um, so quickly, the next slide. Um, so I had already anticipated coming the field and the last in the panelists, I'm likely to run out of time. So on this slide, I've actually included links to the various uh, products that we've been able to work on. Um, so this includes some of the peer-reviewed uh, journals that, and this particular one is on the insights from the mapping of tracking indicate, uh, tracking elements within NAPS and NDCs. Um, that has also been invited to be published as a uh, as a policy policy brief still in Nature Climate Change. So it tries to showcase how you can actually move from a journal article to packaging the information in a way that is more easily accessible for by policymakers through a policy brief. And then here you'll also find a link to a tool that we specifically designed for countries to be able to use to track how adaptation is taking place in the livestock sector, especially for international reporting. And then you'll also get access to a number of the other data sets that we've worked on. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that in terms of just showcasing some of the work that and how as a boundary organization we've been um, engaging in the space on adaptation tracking, moving from the global all the way to the portfolio level. And especially the value of working in this way is that it enables us to, to understand the connections between different actors. How can we make sure that they are bringing to the fore evidence that can actually support a more comprehensive understanding of adaptation progress across scale? Um, so I'll leave it at that and looking forward to discussion that can help us to unpack uh, a bit more of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, this was this was really a very rich uh, set of, of presentations. Um, as a result, we are now pushing the boundary of time. Um, it is exactly one minute before we should close um, this webinar. Um, but I have permission from the organizers to keep you here if you are able to for 10 or 15 more minutes to actually have a, a, a Q&A session. Um, if you're not able to continue, if you have other commitments, that's of course fully understood. But if you are able to stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes, it would be wonderful if we could have a bit more discussion based on the conversations and the presentations that we have just had. Um, I see a number of messages in the chat. Um, there's a question from Roger. Is there any to share the information? I'm sure that will be done. Uh, we will share the power of presentation. So that's already the answer. And um, there is a comment. This is a great webinar. Could I also invite anybody to um, uh, address any or to answer any, uh, ask any questions, either in the chat or by raising your hand. Um, and if there are no questions at the moment, then I will ask a question. Um, I will ask a question. Um, and whoever is here on from, from, from the speakers, feel free to um, to, to address it if you if you think this is relevant for you. 
Um, we, we heard a number of presentations uh, talking about uh, the importance of the uh, you know, science policy interface to inform policy processes with the work that boundary organizations are doing. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, and I sort of felt that in between the lines from the presentations we heard from, from Morocco, from the South Pacific and a few others, that there's perhaps also another role that boundary organizations have, and that is in coordinating some of the um, uh, activities of um, policymakers, um, possibly because uh, policymakers tend to be uncoordinated, but possibly also because through coordination, uh, the information that we provide uh, could be particularly uh, impactful. Are there any speakers or perhaps other members of the audience who would like to reflect on perhaps a policy coordination role that uh, boundary organizations may not necessarily choose to have, but end up having uh, in the engagement they have with policymakers? My default is to ask Katie to answer first. Oh, we've got such great uh, expertise on the call. Uh, I'm really keen to hear from others on this as well. Certainly, I think it's a role that um, I I see uh, myself playing and a lot of my colleagues playing um, uh, as part of this relationship building uh, that we end up doing a lot of collaborative work together and coordination sometimes. And um, I think it can be uh, yeah, a very important role and function of, of boundary organizations where they have the, the capacities to, to do so. Uh, but would love to hear from experiences from others and indeed members of the audience uh, who also work for boundary organizations would love to hear your thoughts and perspectives on this too. Pilar, I saw that you switch on your camera. That's a good sign that you would like to contribute to this conversation. Thank you, Richard, and, and uh, for the question in particular, I, I agree with, with Katie that um, policy coordination role is quite critical, but also very challenging uh, because many in many cases, um, when uh, these kind of organizations, and, and I refer to, to the hub in particular, um, we are, a lot of different organizations with different interests from regions, from different regions and um, and sizes. So uh, the topics that the different organizations are working on also differ in many cases. So it's a, a learning process because maybe you started uh, this role with some specific interests and some topics and then um, what we build together is different in in all in all ways, but all good uh, uh, related to that. So to really, in particular, we, uh, our coordination is is focused on this strategic role and international diplomacy on both, uh, for example, in this case, the group adaptation and loss and damage. So um, to build together these. Uh, annual strategy, annual objectives, very clear benchmarks. So to really land all uh, these different interests is, uh, is challenging, but every year is better. So different organizations started to join the conversation and we build something different again. So it's like an, an animal that is all the time changing and it's beautiful uh, in, in, in that way uh, with all those changes. So um, yeah, I wanted to to share that that not all not all um, it's not only an issue of coordinating uh, equals and same type of organizations, but in particular how to coordinate the differences. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. Uh, that, considering that reminds not, me of this famous saying that everybody thinks coordination is important, but nobody wants to be coordinated. Um, but boundary organizations are doing a great job. Um, Roger, yes, please, it would be wonderful if we can also hear from you. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, uh, our mission isn't to coordinate policymakers. However, as a public interest group, we do support synergies uh, between all our members by making them exchange together. 
We bring together ministries, universities, local authorities, business and NGOs, and we give them space to see each other and uh, see what they are doing, which, uh, uh, which uh, contributes to coordinate and coherence building in uh, climate change uh, policies. Thank you. Thanks, excellent example. One, one highlight I'd like to maybe mention. Please, by all means. The, okay. coordina the coordination is to uh, move away yeah. from abstracts and get to a real practical, pragmatic, purposeful uh, solutions uh, and focus on uh, solutions that have worked and uh, where both the scientists and the policymakers at the local level have coordinated and created solutions and then amplify those. That is, a that is I, I think, a very effective way of conveying the importance of coordination, because otherwise what tends to happen is in, in uh, discussions uh, between the policymakers is everything gets very abstract and uh, we're talking only of the contours, but not the real actual action that needs to happen. So focus on that and bring out uh, some workable models and solutions uh, that have resulted in that kind of good coordination. Brilliant. Uh, Lucy, would you also like to come in? Yeah, sure. Um, I think on this question of coordination, uh, maybe it's to go back to one point that was raised by, I think, one of the participants earlier, in terms of how, because it's, of course, I think the first point alluded to the coordination that boundary organizations do when it comes to bringing together the let's say if it's the science and the policy space and also like the practice, but it's also maybe a question of how we can enhance coordination between the boundary organizations. I think the webinar today had a lot of uh, rich and very practical lessons that we can learn. And perhaps it's also a question of how we can be able maybe to package this to enhance the learning. Uh, because even for myself, uh, I learned a lot like with what they was uh, presenting in terms of their coordination program. So maybe how can we be able to package some of these lens lessons in a way that can be picked up also by other uh, boundary organizations. And hopefully this can also work towards uh, developing a more comprehensive strategy because you'll find that some of these organizations we are working in the same geographies, working on the same topic, but we rarely also coordinate as boundary organizations. So I'll be really keen to see how we can maybe also be able to package some of the insights from this webinar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, excellent. I think I think this links also to what Roger Street wrote in the chat. Um, Roger, if you, if you don't mind, um, because I I might not I might not do quite justice to you when I paraphrase what you wrote. Would you mind just coming in and and ask your question, and then we'll have one final round along the panelists, and uh, then we will conclude. Can you hear me, Richard? Yes, we can. What I was getting at with the, my first part of my question was really, what can we do as in Boa? to facilitate some of the things that we're hearing here. And, you know, sharing the presentations is really good. And I didn't want to under underestimate the quality of that, but what much more is needed. And with the dialogues that we need, that we can have of how we can engage the boundary organizations in a learning environment. And what I'm getting at there is, is that, you know, look at this coordination question, for example. It, it would be, you know, I listen to these presentations and there's a lot of similarity of what people are doing. How can we work together as a suite of boundary organizations? It all doesn't, it doesn't have to be everybody. You know, two or three could be working on a specific aspect and we could use INBOA as a means of facilitating that coordination so that we're building a, a much stronger picture of that, that can inform and engage policymakers. So I was doing a lot more thinking along those lines, and I think it would be quite useful to think about what or uh, in Oboa could be doing. And yes, the webinar was fantastic. I learned a lot, but I need I, how can we take it further? More than that. Thank that, you. That's great. So let me just ask each of the speakers to say one or two sentences at max of what do you think should be the next steps of the International Network for Boundary Organizations on Adaptation to make the impact that we all wanted to have on adaptation? 
And let's let's start from the top. So first, Obas, and then go through the program. Thank you, and uh, again, uh, thank you to everyone for this very rich discussion and uh, sharing of information. But to specifically to your question, I think uh, what is important and looking in the immediate future for the COP and and beyond is to identify uh, possibly some champions uh, and to so that both in the parties network and beyond so that they can amplify the work of the boundary organizations uh, zooming in on one or two topics so that the work of boundary organizations is is communicated amplified and it sticks and, and it, it gets conveyed in the uh, in in the UNFCCC world so to speak which is kind of what, what it is perfect thank you Katie Thanks. I would say I get invited a lot to discussions on uh, that share information, tools, tactics, strategies uh, on the mitigation side of climate change. And I really don't on uh, on the adaptation side of things. So I'm really excited about this network. I think it's much needed. Uh, I think just the fact that exists, it exists is uh, uh, it will be helpful to a lot of us. But to really encourage the Emboa Network to to convene more sessions where you bring together this expertise, drawing on from what Lucy just said, but to share to share experience, to share expertise, expertise, to share tactics, um, and generally allow us to be much more collaborative. We have strength in numbers. Great, thank you, uh, Rajan, please. Maybe uh, 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 we can propose uh, first more meeting like this, uh, one to learn, uh, like to, to this one to, to learn from one uh, other, uh, to maybe uh, publish common publication on adaptation, on uh, metric of adaptation and on other topics. And the three, organize common capacity building session uh, for, uh, um, uh, all stakeholders, uh, in maybe in, in in developing countries. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Let's go straight to Philomena. Apologies for keeping you yeah. away. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's already morning here. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, I think in addition to what others have said and, and the comments I made in response to, to the same question that was asked before, you know, before this webinar, uh, I didn't even know about um, this network until uh, the team and, and the secretary reached out to spread uh, if they're interested uh, to join the network. And I think it's important that, uh, and I'm, so, I'm seeing great value uh, in the work that the network is doing, but I think it's important to make people aware of this network and what it can bring and what it can do. My second point um, is there are other networks that are around, right? We've got the UN for NAPS, for example. Next year is the Adaptation Futures as well because we're collaborating with them. There are others as well. It would be really good to look at bringing them together, including this, uh, you know, this network, and, and, and look at solutions that could drive real action on the ground. Um, you know, the, we've heard the issues around accessing finance because we need money to do these things. These don't, these, the money doesn't fall off the sky. We need the money for small countries like the ones in the region. But how can we use that knowledge base, that expertise to really help countries who really need that help to access financing to catalyze ambitious and transformative adaptation on the ground? I think that's important to me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Pilar, final reflection from you. We might have just I we think might have had to Pilar. step away. Yeah. Okay. No problem at all. Then Lucy, you're still here. Yes. Okay. Again, <laughs> coming in last. I think there are a lot of very good suggestions that have come up. So it's maybe a question of seeing uh which of these can actually uh, deliver on low-hanging fruit. Uh, perhaps it's to think about, um, I'm still very much stuck on that uh, challenge of how such a network can enhance learning. Um, 
I know, I, I think from, I'm similar to Philomena, I didn't actually know about the network. I actually got to read a little bit about it when I got the invitation to be in this panel. Uh, but I see there are already some organizations working in the continent. So also it's about how can we foster learning within uh, boundary organizations working within similar uh, context. How can we then actually even then be able to synthesize some learnings that can have uh, global relevance? So I think there's a great opportunity seeing the network as a convener. And there are a lot of innovative approaches that we can also be able to leverage to just um, enhance the sharing of lessons. Um, such a platform as the webinar today has been really invaluable in sharing some of these lessons, but I think it's also thinking about how this can be sustained to make sure that we are building on the momentum. Thanks. Right. Thank, thanks so much for these reflections on the next steps. Um, I should have the final word, but I don't have time. So all I'm going to do is thank the speakers so much for your time, your interest and your wisdom. Uh, this was really, really helpful and um, incredibly inspiring. Um, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Katie, Orsa and Alicia for setting up the, uh, the webinar and making sure that it runs smoothly. And I would like to thank all the colleagues at uh, Uranos in Montreal for um, setting up in BOA and hopefully ensuring it has uh, a very uh, promising future. Um, thank you all for uh, bearing with us. Uh, it has taken a little bit longer than we uh, had hoped, uh, but that is, of course, also because there is so much to say. Um, thanks again uh, also to Oves uh, for uh, coming out of retirement to awesome. speak to us uh, and, and all the other speakers. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. And I also hope to see many of you at the COP in Baku. Thank you. Bye-bye. Excellent. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.